As entrepreneurs and growing companies, you and I have heard again and again how we should be hiring A players, rock stars, all the time. Go for the best talent possible. Now hold on, is that actually true? There's a study, a fascinating study of 200 companies that might tell us otherwise. In the next few minutes, I'm gonna share with you some fascinating research of real world companies from the United States of America that might prove otherwise. Back in 1994, two sociologists at Stanford University named James Barron and Michael Hannon wanted to prove their idea that culture was more important than pretty much anything in a company. They sought out two local companies that were starting up, and at the time they didn't realize that they were actually reaching out to the beginning of Silicon Valley. Over the next 15 years, they tracked the progress of over two hundred companies to try and figure out the impact of culture on company performance. What they discovered absolutely floored them. They studied everything from how employees were hired, what they were paid, the org chart of how the company was set up, also who was hired, who was fired. They took a look at culture from every possible angle that they could. They identified surprisingly that there was only five different kinds of culture. Amongst all those 200 companies, it came down to just five different cultures. The first of the five is called star culture. This is what you and I hear about all the time. Let's go and get the best possible talent from the best universities, possibly recruit people from other top companies, put the best people in the room and hopefully give them enough money to get started and voila, you should have a winning team, right? Well, let's see. The second kind of culture is called engineering culture. If you think of the movie The Social Network when we see all those engineers working together, plugged in and sipping Mountain Dew nonstop, that is engineering culture. It's all about product first. A lot of the engineers aren't necessarily considered to be stars yet, but they might be in a few years if they can really prove themselves. Facebook is in fact an example of engineering culture. The third kind of culture is what's known as bureaucratic culture. In a bureaucracy, as you would expect, there's a ton of middle management, there's a ton of rules, there's a ton of procedures, there's a ton of structure, the organizational chart is very rigid and established, and it's more of the like big corporate feel that you might think of. The fourth kind of culture is autocratic culture, which is like a bureaucracy except that all the needs and wants of the entire company are pointed towards the desires of one single person, usually the CEO founder. There is a notorious saying from one of these kinds of CEOs who said, show up, do what I tell you, you get paid, and that's it. <laughs> now the fifth kind of culture is what's known as commitment culture. This is considered outdated and old. It's the old school care about the company first. It's a big focus on human resources and training and it's all about slow and steady growth and considered actually by many executives to be a thing of the past. American manufacturing back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s really was big on commitment culture and many of those firms have since died off because they weren't willing to cut jobs when a lot of the manufacturing type work was more affordable to send overseas. So at the end of 15 years and 200 companies, what did Barron and Hannon find? Incredibly, they discovered a few things. Number one, as expected, the rock star cultures, in fact, did produce some of the biggest successes of any of the companies they followed. They had valuations, some of them into the billions of dollars and are some of the most famous names that we can think of coming out of Silicon Valley. Now, surprisingly, the star culture also produced many of the biggest failures. There's tons of internal rivalries inside of a rock star culture. And when, it, when they crashed and burned, it was pretty spectacular. On the other end of the scale, they were astounded to find out that the surest bet of all, the one that most consistently was successful, was actually commitment culture. They witnessed how commitment culture had way more trust amongst teammates, 
because they invested far more into training, everybody was able to be more autonomous. There was less middle management. The teams were more flexible and agile. They were quicker to see market changes because they knew their customer better. Because they had more time and more patient in finding top talent, they were able to get just the right candidate for the right spot who's more autonomous and self-directed. And because they valued the worker experience inside the team, teammates stuck around for far longer. A hidden advantage to commitment culture is that you don't lose the customers and the knowledge that you lose when you, a team member goes away somewhere else. In fact, commitment culture companies were consistently the most profitable. They were the fastest to go to IPO. And this last point absolutely blows me away. Not a single commitment culture company failed. Not a single one failed. Of 200 companies, those that were commitment culture, after 15 years, not a single one of them failed. So now you might be wondering, well, if commitment culture is so effective and so profitable, why do venture capitalists talk about rock star businesses, that star culture, so much? Well, you need to realize that for a venture capitalist to be successful, their approach is, let's invest in 10 companies knowing that only one or two are going to hit. And those one or two are gonna be a huge success and it's gonna make up for the eight or nine losses that we invest in as well. So for them, it's about playing the odds and finding that one absolute jackpot. But on the flip side, what if we're talking about you and I? We are the entrepreneurs. We're not investing in 10 companies. We're investing in one. That's our company. All chips in, time, energy, money, everything is going into one single company, our company. To have a commitment culture means that we are giving ourselves the highest possible odds of actually succeeding and being sustainable over the medium and long term. It's not, for us anyways, it's not about just one big payday and kind of like rolling the dice. This is about us having to cut our own check on a week in and week out basis and also help everybody else who's on our team. The topic of culture is a huge one and it can fundamentally change the direction of your company based on what culture you build inside your team. For more information on this topic, I encourage you to check out a book called Faster, Better, Smarter, I think it's called, by Charles Duhigg. I'm curious to know what you think. Do you think commitment culture is legitimate? If so, put it in the comments below. If you disagree with me and you don't think commitment culture is everything this study is talking about, I'd also like to hear about it. Put it in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. The topic of culture is a very, very important one and one that requires us as leaders of growing companies to pay close attention to. Oftentimes, who we choose and how we treat people, which is a lot of what culture is, dictates everything else that happens. It's the first five or 10% that we take care of that then affects the next 80% of what the day-to-day -day is like in our companies and how our customers experience us. Thank you so much for watching.